So thank you for coming to this panel. Uh, it's going to be a discussion panel. I'm going to start with a primer on furry, uh, furry 101. Uh, first, about myself. I'm a furry, have been for uh, more years than I care to count. Uh, got into furry with the name furry after reading Omaha the Cat Dancer, but I grew up being a fan of anthropomorphic animals. So what are furries? There's some furries. <laughs> I'm a furry. There's other furries in the audience that aren't as obviously furry because furry's not any one thing. Uh, at the broadest, anyone who has an affinity for some degree of animals with human characteristics or humans with animal characteristics, either way, is a furry. Uh, it's a label, so there are people who like it but don't claim the label. That's perfectly fine. There are people who have a more spiritual view and claim the label. That's also perfectly fine because it's an identity. Uh, there's fans of art, be it music, videos, uh, drawings with anthropomorphic themes and characters. There's people who role play characters in any of a number of places. We'll touch on that. Uh, there's some people with a more animistic or shamanistic or spiritual side. Uh, whether they believe that they themselves are part or all animal or have a totem or spirit guide. Uh, there's lifestylers, of which there's just as many varieties of lifestylers as there are varieties of other types of furries. They just make it part of their entire life. And there's fursuiters and costumers, which I don't know if you've noticed there's a couple in the audience. Everywhere. We're everywhere. You don't always know which of us. So, there's been a history of anthropomorphics. It's not necessarily what you'd call furry. I'm not saying that the Egyptians were furries, but they did have anthropomorphics. Lord Ganesh, definitely an anthropomorphic. The white-faced lady, very much an anthropomorph. These can be seen kind of as the ancient ancestors to furry. Uh, satyrs, centaurs, werewolves. Uh, animistic spirits would also fit in historical roots of anthropomorphism. Uh, there's Disney and Warner Brothers characters. Gee, I grew up on Bugs Bunny. Uh, later, Fritz the Cat in the 60s started bringing it from just the Warner Brothers mostly innocent fun. I say mostly innocent. Rewatch older Bugs Bunny. It was not as innocent as you might remember. <laughs> Fritz the Cat was not innocent. And especially the very camp gay crow. Uh, Watership Down, the bunnies, they could talk to each other in English. They were anthropomorphic. They thought like, more like people than like bunnies. Uh, Last Unicorn, again, she was very much not morphic herself, but it's, her thought processes were what we would normally attribute to uh, humans or similar. Uh, in books, Man Xin Wars was one of the earlier uh, books with anthropomorphics. Uh, Star Trek the Animated Series, quite a few people who've gone into furry in the 70s came in through the animated series and Lieutenant M. Ress. Uh, mainstream comics. Anyone know Tigra, Wolfsbane, Cheetah from DC Comics, Gorilla Grodd from Flash? Uh, 
there's this movie coming out soon, uh, Rocket Raccoon. Don't call him a raccoon to his face. Uh, so the Funny Animals comics were considered a different genre, but they're close enough that the, there's crossover between people who just see them as comics that happen to have these funny animal characters and anthropomorphic uh, furry characters. So Omaha the Cat Dancer, as I said, was where I learned the term furry. Uh, where furry started becoming more of a scene was around the time that conference started. Uh, that was a convention in Southern California founded by someone, according to lore, uh, by advertising heavily among alternative lifestylers. Uh, it's hard to find references as to whether the lore is correct. That's the way the myth goes. Uh, I happen to know that they had a pet auction, which had very heavy leather themes. And Purple Nurple Live, uh, Furry Muck, has a room called the Purple Nurple. It's a LGBT club. And some people may also know Queer Duck. So furries and gaming, they, we're all over the place. There's role-playing games. Bunnies and Burrows was one of the earliest ones. Uh, quite a few games, including very old ones, had cat people, lycanthropes. Uh, we've got a flying monkey with patagia like a flying squirrel from Star Frontiers. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Rifts had anthro characters. Werewolf the Apocalypse. Uh, I know a lot of furries that love Werewolf the Apocalypse and Changeling the Dreaming. Ow! <laughs> uh, Iron Claw is a specifically furry game made by furries for furries. Same with World Tree. Uh, there's a game based on the comic Usagi Yojimbo, which is more funny animal, but it's Japanese style adventures. Legend of the Five Rings has the Naga, which are snake people, and Nizumi, ratlings. A more recent one is Golden Sky Stories, where you play animals that can turn into people. I, it's a little unusual in that the conflicts aren't violent conflicts. It's a genre that di didn't exist in American role playing until recently. Uh, heartwarming, everyday magic. Uh, MUDs, uh, multi-user dungeons, mucks. Uh, Tiny Mud had a furry contingent. Several furries left Tiny Mud and founded Furry Muck. And there's quite a few others, including tapestries. Uh, one of the tapestries is an adults-only muck. And it can be joked that there's a room for it on tapestries. In computer gaming, we've got Sonic the Hedgehog. We've got Ratchet and Clank, Conquer, the Spyro series, Bloody War, Tekken, Star Control has always had furry characters from my favorite, the show Fixty, Little Psychotic Bastards, uh, the Yehat, Pekunk, so birds. Elder Scrolls with the Argonians in Khajiit. MMOs have also, uh, mostly cat people of various types, the Cathar, the Icadians, and oh God, what do they call them? It wasn't Lyrans, they've changed the name. Due to several legal issues, Star Trek Online's Klingon side have Xin that aren't called Xin, they're not called Lyrans, uh, Ferrisans, that's what they're called. And it's all due to different legal wrangling. Uh, EverQuest 1 and 2 have furry characters. World of Warcraft, I've got a Taran here. There's also Pandaren, Worgen, and Draenei. 
So that's covering where furries can be found in games, in the game itself, as opposed to just furries who play the games. Quick uh, overview of the demographics. Uh, in a few different polls, we've got one in 2002 that showed 25% straight, 19% homosexual, 48% bisexual. That was a fairly limited poll. It was 360 uh, respondents. Another later also unscientific poll, uh, out of 487, we've got mostly in the Kinsey 2, 3, uh, 4, and 5, which fairly typical. But you'll notice that from equally heterosexual to exclusively homosexual is slightly higher than the normal uh, non-furry population. There's some discussion about whether this is related to where uh, the person who founded conference initially recruited people to join the convention. There's, it's hard to tell. It could just be that we're just that open. When it comes to gender, <laughs> uh, there's a personals page, pounce.org. They estimate that one in 62 furries consider themselves trans. I'm one of them. Uh, in the broader population, the current estimate is 2 to 5% are considered trans. Those that seek sex reassignment are between 1 in 12,000 for male to female and 1 in 34,000 in female to male. Shared imagery. We've got bears. We've got cubs. <laughs> there are wolves, foxes, otters. You had me at woof. <laughs> and bull dykes. Anyone else? <laughs> so there are some shared challenges between the LGBT gamer community and furry community. Uh, the first, and everyone probably has run into this, community misunderstanding and derision. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people using that's so gay uh, it seems to be getting a little better, but there's still a lot of, dude, that's gay. Uh, why do you have to bring it in game? Uh, I've actually seen religious-based attacks on both furry and on LGBT gamers. Uh, there's media-inspired misunderstandings of both, both groups. Uh, and there's internal disagreements. LGBT with the trans and the bi sometimes don't see eye to eye with the rest of the community. Uh, furries, there's a group called the Burned Furs, which consists a lot of, why do you have to bring it into our fandom? Uh, there's other groups that have their own views of what is appropriate for furry or for gaming. So now we move into the meat, discussing uh, how can LGBT gamers help furries? How can furries help gamers? So anyone have any ideas? Any questions? Yes. Well, sort of a comment. identities that they are portraying 
And we as gamers, when we see characters like, for example, Star Fox, I think Star Fox is a really awesome character. Star um, Fox is. Yeah. So, you know, as a character, as a gamer, I, I enjoy his character. And I'm sure that there are other people. We can use that as like a common ground to at least see eye to eye. Because I believe there's probably some stigmatization against furries in the gay community. So. I've seen some. Nothing that unusual compared to the general uh, gaming community, but I have seen a little bit of stigmatization. Um, one thing to remember is that most furries, even those that are uh, heteronormative or cisgender, are relatively open-minded about LGBT. There's a lot of allies in the furry community. Uh, not everyone, obviously, but a fair number of us do see allies pretty much wherever we can see allies. Uh, we're also very big on acceptance. If you accept us for who we are, we are very likely to accept you for who you are. Uh, quite a few of us are outspoken members of the LGBT community. Uh, there was a furry pride float in Pride just a few weekends ago. Um, and several furry groups give to organizations like the Trevor Project. So we do a lot of outreach towards the LGBT community. Uh, we've got a fairly large LGBT community in furry fandom. I, any other comments? I, any ideas how gamers, uh, reaching out to the furries is definitely a way. I, any furries here have a way to help the gamers? Would you? Yeah. Here. I can try that. <laughs> this should help a little. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, it's right. a good one. Well, uh, on the issue of isolation and things like that, I think that they're both sort of internet-driven communities a lot of the time. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, eat the microphone. That better. <laughs> and so one of the things that you can do, I think, is there are very often hierarchies in every culture. Anything nerdy at all is definitely the same rules apply. Um, probably most people who are gamers and most people who are furries have been bullied at one point or another in their lives. And I think it's important to remember not to shift that hierarchy onto each other because very often uh, role players, for example, people who play Dungeons and Dragons may say, LARPers are silly. LARPers are kind of goofy because they run around in costumes. I wouldn't know anything about that. Um, Neither would I. Nothing. Yeah. No. And I think it's important to remember that even if it seems a little strange, there's really nothing harmful about it at all. It's just uh, something kind of different, something that maybe freaks you out a little bit, but maybe it's kind of cool at the same time if you stop and think about it for a second. And then furries, you know, like you said, there's many furry gamers as well. Probably just have to remember that just because someone plays Grand Theft Auto doesn't mean they're going to go kill somebody. Well said. And I, I think on sort of the same subject um, that I, a lot of the sort of um, challenges that the very that the groups have with just um, interacting with society, or well, that's not quite the right term. Um, a lot of us are kind of ostracized from society, and I think both groups get a lot of that. Uh, less so in San Francisco than other places. But, Obviously. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think a lot of the challenges are definitely uh, common yeah, amongst would, the groups. I, I would say that uh, in, in or out of suit, I felt way more welcome, way more loved, and way more comfortable at a furry convention than I ever did on like Castro Street or something like that. I mean, 
We like, we like to think of the gay community as pretty pretty open and accepting, and it seems like furries are even more so than, than even, even the LGBT community, in, in my experience. So one thing that I just thought of, uh, furries as a community tend to deal with people who are causing problems uh, mostly by minimizing their contact with the problem people. Uh, ostracism of problematic people is one of the biggest ways that furry interacts uh, with those that are being bad neighbors. So I know that oftentimes gamers don't consider that. I think maybe some degree of, dude, you're being a jerk. Stay over there. Actually does fit. <laughs> now, of course, if you're not being a jerk, come on over. <laughs> Any other, anyone else? Get more furry video games. That would, if you're at all a creator, create games with what you like. I create furry video games, create gay furry video games, gay trans furry video games. I, with different cultures, then bring up another interesting question, actually. So sure. No, go ahead. Um, with the, are there actually any developers here out of curiosity? Not currently, but... Um, Do you want the mic? When considering... Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Here. Yeah, how about I stand up and actually talk into the mic? Um, when considering making characters in a game, say, uh, I don't know how many of you are actually writers uh, as well as developers or how many land in that. Sorry, thank you. Um, but uh, when considering making a character, their sexuality, their being furry or not, um, it becomes sort of a, it's amplified here, I guess you could say. But within the scope of the game, how incidental is it? Um, that's a consideration I always kind of take into account when I'm writing characters for writing or anything of that nature. Um, and in that regard, I think making it more incidental makes it more approachable by those who are not within our community. Um, as gamers, you will be exposing yourself to a broad range of folks, um, not just the LGBT community, not just furries. Uh, you'll, even if you're not trying to, you're going to outreach to these people. So making their characters, characters approachable and incidentally gay, incidentally furry. I think that's um, probably a good consideration when writing a character. That said, how often does that come up for anyone who's written for a character, say? Yeah, I, don't, I don't know uh, who the other guy was, but I guess to, to kind of go into that, it's not easy to develop a character, I'll say that. So if you were to like post in the forums of some you know, game that's coming out that you like, hey, I want to add that character, I want to add that character. So I just wanted to throw that out there right there. But we do listen to the community. I'm a community manager myself, so it's my job to take your input from the community in the forums, on the social networks, and to give that to the developers to say, hey, there's this smaller but vocal and growing community, this group, like for this example, uh, this group of furry uh, members that want more characters representing them. They like playing these kind of characters. What can we do here? That's, that's personally my job. And it happens. We are able to take the community's feedback and quite often make something happen of it, make another character into the game, represent. Um, I know that a couple of game developers are doing that right now um, on the, I think, the female side, where some there, there's a consensus that there's too many male characters um, especially the stronger first-person shooter, MOBA, competitive games. Where are the female characters? So there's a movement there, and it's happening. So just, you know, developers do listen to the community. So I'll just put that out there for you guys if you want to.
try to speak about getting some sort of character in a game. And developers will sometimes fall down. There are people. People fall down. People step back up. So just because they don't do it once doesn't mean that it's, they're hating on whatever group you want them to do. It's just another chance for you to say, hey, we really would like to see in the next uh, Assassin's Creed, for example, female characters. Uh, with furries as people, you wouldn't be able to tell I'm a furry most, most of the week. Uh, I don't wear the ears all the time. I'm doing them special for here. Uh, partially because they hurt the ear from the clamp. <laughs> but they also get people talking. And I like when people talk. I love community. Getting people to come together and be better than they are apart. This is a big thing for me. Aww. So we've still got a fair bit of time. I, A1, have anything that they'd like to say about themselves and how they interact with their community? Sure. Want to come up, or do you want to be loud? Sure thing. Sure. Because it sounds like you play MMOs and Yes. Uh, I played a lot of anthropomorphic characters in MMOs, just like you. Yeah. Um, but I was wondering if you wanted like if you were to want furry inclusion in a video game, would you want characters to be would you want more anthropomorphic characters or would you want like a human component for the human game? I actually would go either way. If it was a character with a storyline, just having them have some aspect just trivially mentioned as an aspect of them as a fully featured character would be interesting. I've played several MMOs where I played anthropomorphic characters. I've also played several where I played just flat out humans. Uh, City of Heroes. <sighs> had a lot of character customization. Uh, so you could build a character that really felt to you like a super being. I uh, could match your view of what this character should be able to look like. Uh, Champions Online is both more and less configurable at the same time. Uh, for those, being able to do what inspires you actually is very important. The, de the devs give you the tools to do that, but then it's on you to use the tools. And I like that. That's one of those areas of collaboration. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. say that you know, some relatively large percentage of furries are gay. And anybody that's ever been to a furry con can definitely tell that there's a lot of gay furries. Um, why do you think there's such a disproportionate number of, uh, uh, of gays and furry compared to just the general populace? So my belief about it, aside from the conference thing, is that we are very accepting. Because we go out of our way to accept others into the herd or the pack or whatever, I, hmm? the school, there are a few fish furries. Uh, furry doesn't just apply to those with a mammal bent. There, there are scalies, there's avians. Some of the people that I alluded to, uh, other kin, uh, 
But I think that it's the fact that we are so welcoming is part of what attracts people from the sexual minorities and the gender minorities. Yes? Actually, I have my own little theory about that, too. Sure. Um, do you want a microphone, or do you want to be loud? I just get I love your shirt. Oh, thank you. Love it. Uh, one little theory that I've got is that, uh, you know, in the coming out process, you have to deal with your sexuality, and that includes all its quirks. So you much more likely to explore those than somebody who's straight and just takes things for granted. That's my own personal theory about it. So you're going to see a lot more kink, like uh, leather or furries or drag queens or whatever, because you know, you're growing up and you have to deal with it. So that's my thoughts on it. There is that. As furry is an exploration of identity, encouraging people who are exploring identities just seems natural, yeah? I have a, a kind of a theory on that too. Sure. Um, I think that for most people, probably more than we have studies for, sexuality is a pretty fluid thing. It can change throughout someone's life. I'm gay, I've pretty much always been gay, so I feel like I'm kind of the minority most of the time, not just because I'm gay, but because I suspect that people who are 100% Kinsey 1 or 100% Kinsey 6 are pretty rare. And then in a community like Furry, where like you said, it's very accepting, the, there's no stigma against exploring things that you may not be always 100% into. Maybe you're mostly straight, but you have a crush on this one guy and you kind of want to explore that. Furries aren't going to hold that against you. And then maybe you might decide later on, I tried it. It wasn't for me. I'm going to stick with women. That's OK, too. Or as I've heard it called, Bowie sexual. <laughs> Everyone would be David Bowie. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> true, true. Okay. John Berriman. Almost everyone I know has a crush on Berriman. Uh, so we've got 10 minutes. Yeah, do you want to come up here or be loud? I'll just be loud. Um, okay. I'm, this is all pretty new, so I'm, I just have some questions. Um, you By all means. You types of uh, animal furries. I'm wondering if that also extends to, like, plants, because the people, like, there are some that go in for anthropomorphic plants. Uh, we are, they are rare. I met one person that's their persona, not everyone has a persona, but one person has a persona that's a toaster. So. Also cockroaches. Is she a brave little toaster? I do believe that she is a brave little toaster. And kudos for the reference. There's even at least one cockroach in the furry community. Famous. He is relatively famous. Uh, the other question, you mentioned the term burned furs, they don't want to be fandom? Burned furs have a very narrow definition of what the fandom is. They want the fandom to be just that. So they see people who bring being gay being trans, being kink, anything like that as being going beyond what furry is. And most of them don't like that. Uh, for me, furry is that narrow thing, but that doesn't preclude you from being and. You can be furry and gay, sure. You could be furry and a gamer, sure. I have no problem with this. Also true. So you're not, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't really qualify as being part of that burned fur movement. I am not a burned fur. I so welcome. The ones who are advocating to keep the definition narrow. So they're, they're saying not only keep the definition narrow, but you want to 
add and, no, get out. Right, that's uh, whereas I go, come on in, the water's fine. <laughs> yeah? Uh, may I have a mic? Certainly. I love your shirt too. Oh, thank you. Uh, hi. Um, really, this is more something that I just felt like I wanted to share. Uh, than a question or, you know, concern. Um, when I was coming to terms with my own sexuality, um, probably around like 14, 15, you know, just getting to, you know, I had been a sexual person before that, but kind of having to look at some of the hard questions like, why do I keep thinking about that guy in my chemistry class? Um, <laughs> At that time, I was doing two other things. I was playing dumb shoot man games. I loved Counter-Strike 1.6. It was great. Um, and I had friends that I played with um, who were into this weird art. And um, <laughs> they had sprays that were very uh, enlightening. Um, <laughs> um, but, but it was a community, first and foremost. Uh, it was, as opposed to, these are just some random dudes that I'm playing this game with. These were people who largely cared about how I was doing, who spoke about their own personal lives in, in fairly candid ways, and were just inclusive. Um, and it was hard for me coming from a very, you know, <laughs> conservative area and background to turn that away, to go, no, you know what? I don't want to be accepted and loved by all these people. Um, so my introduction to furry was kind of, uh, it, it co arose with my introduction to the queer community. And the two are fairly inextricably linked for me now. Um, I feel that that sense of community, and that's kind of what I, I judge you were uh, talking about um, feeling is so important. That sense of community that you know we care about one another, that we are accepting of one another, is the thing that I feel uh, brings furries together, but also brings uh, us together for this con for you know LGBT gamers, I feel like that kind of community can only be a good thing, can only support us uh, in better you know finding a fit that works for us in our world. So. Um, Really, you know, to wrap that up, all I wanted to say is that the intersection of those two communities has been very important and formative in, in my search for identity. And thanks. Thanks for sharing. So I got the five minute sign. I'll, do you have a question?
formulated it, but I think really understanding where is the hate coming from? Why is there um, this misunderstanding with the furry community? I mean, that's just what I'm trying to It's a good question. Uh, and there's several places from people who like to punch down rather than punch up, if you know that theory. Uh, the, hmm? Like, like uh, the gentleman mentioned up front, with the, you have things sort of like hierarchy. You have people who are kind of in the middle of the ladder that are just going to push people who are lower on the ladder further down rather than trying to bring everybody else up the ladder. Yeah, and it costs you nothing personally to punch down except a, a bit of your soul because they don't have the power to defend themselves if they're lower. I, punching up has a risk, but it also points out some of the absurdity of the power differentials, and there's a lot of absurdity out there. And last question, sure. Is there anyone here who would like to speak about frolic? <laughs> further confusion, before you speak, let me do further confusion. Further confusion <laughs> is a convention held in San Jose. Uh, it's a, a furry convention we give to charities. Uh, there's artists, there's the fursuit parade, uh, of which we've got some fine examples of fursuiters. <laughs> uh, there's always live animal exhibits. There's panels on any kind of topic from uh, writing to spirituality to, uh, there's been several fursuits, several tech panels. Uh, animal husbandry. As animal husbandry. The number, and we're just, do we have time to just talk about frolic quick? Okay. There. Um, FC also has dances and a party floor, so come party with us. <laughs> um, but, um, frolic, um, every second Saturday of every month actually happening tonight um, at the stud bar. Um, check your com books, because there's info in there. Um, discounts for badges and stuff. Um, it's basically a furry nightclub at a bar. So come dance with us, come drink with us. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And if you don't want to come this month, miss it this month, it happens every month. So uh, yeah, um, I think the website is frolicparty.com or something like that. You just Google it, it'll come up. But yeah, um, thank you. And thank you all for coming.